We're ready to start. Association, and, and I succeeded after him. So, could you please open the conference <coughs> and welcome everyone? Thank you, Timon. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, it um, happened that yesterday I was on a similar meeting in Wuch University where PhD students on life sciences they have organized a very uh, similar conference. <coughs> And it's very important that uh, you are having such a forum of uh, exchange that you can meet and present your, your work. And what I believe is really interesting and, and very encouraging that you have a sort of a mixed group, that it's not meeting in a very specialized team, that uh, social scientists are talking only with social scientists and physics only with physics, because we we'll need a very much interdisciplinary science. We need very much to understand and respect the other disciplines of science and I hope you will find presentations and uh, those thoughts that your colleagues have that are really worth to know and exchange your your own um, impressions. So uh, I wish you very successful and interesting meeting and enjoy your company. Thank you, Thank you very much. So the meeting is all officially open now. I will have before we I give you the floor, Colin. Yeah. Uh, I'll have a couple of technical uh, information. Uh, please 
also use these boards if somebody hasn't put the, the, the poster on yet because they look silly, in my opinion. Naked, sort of. Uh, we will have uh, lunch. It's going to be a sandwich buffet. Uh, I don't remember exactly what time, but, but it's in the agenda and you're all welcome. You can also sit outside where, where the chairs are and the tables. Uh, I would suggest that you stay for the entire meeting, but I understand that things happen and you have plans and so forth. But if you have a chance, please stay. It's going to be interesting all along. Uh, just like every year, this is the 11th edition, we, we, that means you, fight for, fight, well, compete for, for the awards. We have three awards, three main awards. The, the, the first one is for natural sciences, it's the, the award of the director of the institute. The second one is for humanities and, and social sciences, it's awarded by our association. And the third one is for the best poster, and uh, this is uh, awarded by the GeoPlanet, it's a consortium of five uh, Polish Academy of Sciences institutes. We also have a young committee, of, of uh, scientific committee, and if they see a chance to, to recognize some extra works, uh, there will be recognition, special recognition. We introduced this idea last year, and, and we, we decided to continue. <coughs> That uh, we have uh, guests from uh, from the Institute of um, uh, Fluid Machinery. Rohan, could you please manifest yourself? It's, it's, the, it's the one of the worst names in, uh, from the Polish Academy of Science. It's another institute, but Rohan actually is uh, representing Marie Curie uh, stipend. Uh, you, you're the, the contact point in Poland, right? So, if you're interested in Marie Curie, please contact Rohan. He, he's got his stand outside. He will be here long, really all day long, right? So, maybe this is a good opportunity to discuss potentially your future actions or actually now actions. Uh, is there anything else? Paulina, yes, I'm looking at Paulina. Yes, the Rohan presentation during the Oh, yes, uh, Rohan will have also during lunch, he will have a short presentation about Marie Curie system of, of funding uh, young scientists. Yeah. So I suggest that you, that you, when you eat your sandwiches, you take a moment to, to look, at, look at the presentation. Uh, I think that's, that would be it. Uh, at 8 o'clock, uh, club, atelier, traditional after party, you're all welcome. Uh, so I suppose. Colin Campbell from the University of Reading, a keynote speaker. The yes, floor sorry. is yours. Thank you very okay, much. So Thank let's you. start. Um, yeah, I'm just hoping that the PowerPoint slides will appear here. Um, and don't worry, not all my slides will look like this. Um, this was the abstract of the talk that uh, I'm giving this morning. It looks very dense. It is very dense. Um, and it's one of the differences between spoken academic English and written academic English. And this is very much written academic English. Um, and what I'll be exemplifying today is um, spoken, I hope, English. And I hope it will be more comprehensible than this is. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to go back to the first slide, if I may. Can I just go back to the first slide? This one should take me back, I think. Um, my university is paying for my flight from uh, Luton Airport, which must be one of the worst airports in the world. Uh, and if you've had a chance to experience it, you know. And if you've never been to Luton Airport, you are one of the lucky ones and continue to avoid it. A terrible place, yeah? Um, but as my university is sponsoring my flight, I have to mention my university, okay? And I've also brought with me literally hundreds of business cards um, so if you want a business card later, please ask me and I'll give it to you. I'll probably give you one anyway, even if you don't ask, because I have to get rid of those as well. Um, so University of Reading, has anyone heard of Reading? Yes. <laughs> Just one person, no, two people. So, oh yeah, right, four people, yeah. Reading is halfway between London and Oxford, uh, which are two slightly more famous neighbours of Reading. 
So if you get on the train from London and you're heading towards Oxford, it goes straight through Reading, okay? which is a pity because it has a few things to offer, including quite a good university. Okay? And I'm hoping today that some of you at least get to know something about the University of Reading, and in the future, you may have an opportunity to contact some of our schools. We have some very, very good schools and things like meteorology, cybernetics, environmental sciences, psychology, etc., etc. So there may be opportunities for cooperation between some of you in the future and some of our academics at Reading University, and that would be very good. What I'm going to be talking about today is something called EMI, um, and it's this is I'm only going to use two acronyms today. EMI is the first one. Uh, I can't remember whether I explained it in the abstract or not. It stands for English as a medium of instruction. English as a medium of instruction. In other words, where we use, we teach subjects, disciplines through English. And the reason I'm talking about it is not that it's new, it is not new. In fact, when I lived in um, the Troy Miasta years ago in the 1980s, there was a high school in India, I think it was number three, uh, which actually did run a program of teaching some of the subjects through English. Yeah? So this is not a new phenomenon, but what it is, is at the moment an accelerating phenomenon. It is getting more and more widespread, and I'm sure that at some of the higher educational institutions here in Gdansk and Trojmiasta, there are already are degree courses run through English. Is that true? Okay, some, some nodding of heads, some shaking of heads. Um, and we'll talk about why. What, why is that happening? Um, what are the implications of it, both for the lecturers, the teachers, and for the students, yeah? And one last apology. If you look at the bottom of the screen, where it says limitless potential, limitless opportunities, limitless impact, this was a slogan that someone in marketing at the University of Reading came up with. You know, you study at the University of Reading, everything is limitless. The world is your oyster. You know, the potential is infinite. Uh, and then someone said, everything is limitless except the money. <laughs> you know, so you can have ambitions, but if you don't have the money, um, this is going to be difficult. They have since recently removed this slogan from all of our marketing materials, okay? So that has gone. But this is an old uh, template, PowerPoint template that I'm using. Anyway, that's a little bit about me. What about this EMI stuff? Okay, we're going to jump the abstract. We're going to keep on jumping until we get to the next slide. That's the abstract. Now, lingua franca, we'll talk about briefly later. I like this slide. It's um, a bit, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. It is, of course, the Tower of Babel. Um, and the, the, the metaphor, it's a wonderful metaphor, the Tower of Babel. Because when, uh, when the people constructing it lost a common language, then the progress stopped, the project stopped, and was never completed. Um, and I think it is increasingly important in where we're heading in the world that we do have at least one common language. And that we have the opportunity to use a language to communicate with each other, to cooperate with each other. And if we can cooperate with each other, then maybe we'll complete projects and not stop halfway through. Of course, having a common language doesn't necessarily ensure consensus or agreement. In the United Kingdom, we have a, a common language, which is English, and we can't agree about Brexit. So having a language to communicate with each other is important, it's necessary, it's wonderful. It doesn't mean to say we're going to agree with each other at all. And that can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. Yeah. Anyway, I like the slide, but let's move on to the... Oh, dear God, I'm going backwards and forwards here. EMI, English as a medium of instruction, how, how common is it around the world? The British Council, and some people might have heard of the British Council, it's kind of, it's a non-governmental organization in the UK. It does get some financial support from the British government, but it is non-governmental. Um, although Mr. Putin seems to think it is governmental, and he has recently, and Jan reminded me of this, uh, closed the British Council in offices in Moscow, as well as throwing out some diplomats. Yeah. But the British Council is soft diplomacy. What its job is, is to promote British culture, British education, cooperation between nations. And I was lucky enough to work for the British Council here in Poland 
uh, about 30 years ago. Yeah, so it's been around for a while. But anyway, they did this survey into the, the state of EMI, English as a medium of instruction, around the world. Yeah? And they did a survey in 55 countries. Now, if you've got good eyesight and you're looking at that list of countries, you might notice something. <laughs> yeah, no Poland. And so I looked at it and thought, oh my God, I cannot use this slide in software. People would say, how come Poland is not there? Poland was one of the three countries they did the, the, the trial survey with. Okay? So before they rolled out this survey to 55 countries, they did a trial survey with three countries in Europe, which they thought were well established in terms of EMI, and those countries were Poland, Austria, and another one that I've forgotten, so thank, thank God I didn't forget Poland. So <laughs> Poland, the British Council did look at the state of EMI in Poland as well, and then they rolled it out to these 55 countries. Yeah. So it is, as you can see from the map, this is, you know, this is not the British Empire in, in bold, in dark blue. This is where EMI is taught at different levels. Uh, and in some countries it's taught at primary levels, secondary levels, and tertiary levels. Um, it's not a one-way street, okay? It's not that oh, everyone is picking up an EMI and saying this is a good thing, let's do it. Some countries are reversing. So countries like Turkey, uh, have actually recently reversed their policy and say, well, there's too much of this. You know, what is important for us is that children learn their curriculum. And if they learn their curriculum better in Turkish, then let's do it in Turkish. Because we want them to do both. We don't want them just to learn English. We want them to be able to use English, but we want them to learn the other subjects in their curriculum as well. So that's a caveat. Yeah, it's not one-way progress. Yeah. But this is an example of... Um, you know, we always use the Dutch, because the Dutch speak English better than most people in the UK anyway. Um, and one of the nice things about, I don't know if you guys are interested in football or not, but here comes a football story anyway. You can always tell the foreign managers on British television. You know, the people like Arsene Wenger at Arsenal, or I'm not going to talk about Mourinho because we don't like him. But there are foreign, foreign uh, managers in the football world in, in England. And the ones who speak the best English are the foreigners. The ones who struggle with English are the ones who were born there, yeah. which is an interesting observation, I think. But the Dutch, of course, um, speak English so fluently that you, know, you talk to a bus driver in English, you know, you talk to a street cleaner in English, and they all understand what you're talking about. This is their policy on language. <clears throat> So they see English as part of internationalization of education. I don't know whether in Poland, you're throwing me out, do you guys talk about internationalization of education? International education, transnational education, the global graduate? Are these the kind of phrases that fall off your tongue as you talk about education? Unfortunately not. Sorry? Unfortunately not. Unfortunately not. Well, okay. I'm not sure if that's unfortunate because we talk about them a lot, although it's not always clear what exactly we mean by them. You know, so what is a global graduate? Put your hand up if you think you're a global graduate. Anyone here think they're a global graduate? Okay, like certain reluctance. And you're a scientist, you're saying, well, what the hell is a global graduate? And then I'll put my hand up, you know. Very good question, and it's one that universities in the UK continue to debate all the time. Um, no university, no self-respecting university in the UK will say, we are not an international university. Every university, University College London has it above their, the gate of their main campus. You know? Welcome to UCL, the international university. So I suppose they're the international university, whereas Reading is just un you know, international university. But we have to nail these things down. What exactly do we mean by them? We have to be critical of this as well. We are, after all, academics. But I'm interested, maybe someone can tell me later whether Poland or the Polish government has a similar language policy to this or not. I'd be interested to know. Why EMI? Institutional reason? Yeah, okay. Bottom line for many uh, managers of universities in the UK, money. 
Yeah, so I don't know how many international students you have at the University of Gdansk, mm -hmm. the Medical Academy of Polish, whatever. I don't know how many you have, but I mean, if you come to Reading University as the campus, there are days and times of the day when you might think it's a Chinese university. And that's no disrespect to the Chinese at all. We welcome our Chinese students, but we have a lot of them, as does every university in the UK. And they pay three times the fees that European students currently pay. Okay. So, yes, let's not be naive about this. Money makes a difference. It may not make the world go around, but it makes a difference, especially to university accountants. It raises the global profile of the institution of the university, so it gets us, the university ready, better known around the world, which is good not just for financial purposes. Again, preparing students for a global career, academic or otherwise. If we are truly a globalized world, and if we actually understand what that means anyway, well then maybe we should be preparing our graduates to operate and to operate effectively in a multicultural, multilingual world. And that, I think, is, is a, a, a worthy aim, that is a worthy aspiration. Yeah? So these are some of the reasons facilitating the exchange of students and staff between institutions worldwide. Again, a worthy aim. But it's not... Um, there are implications to it. And if you're working with international students, um, I mean, I have colleagues in China at the university, at one of the universities in Nanjing. Nanjing is, um, has anyone heard of the city Nanjing? Nanjing? No, it's, I mean, you know, I don't think I'd heard of it until I was invited to go there. And then you embarrassingly find out, oh yeah, it's a city of 20 million people. It has 30 different universities. <laughs> Um, and it has a very uh, bitter history, with, especially in relation to Japan and the war and, and so on. Okay? Um, but when I work there, I'm working with teachers, teachers of other subjects, architecture, engineering, etc. And they're teaching a, an international cohort, students, okay? and they're teaching them through English. Well, obviously the levels of English are different. Okay. I mean, if I'm teaching a course at the University of Reading and it's British students, the, the levels of English is still different, but it, it's a much narrower difference than it is if I'm working with international cohorts. And so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you today. I'm the only person in the room, I think, I'm the only person in the room who's a native speaker of English. Is that right? Is there anyone else here who's a native speaker of English? No, just me. Well, that makes me feel either extremely lonely, vulnerable, or special. I don't know which at the moment. <coughs> Probably the first two. But we have to work with different levels of language proficiency. That's, and I'm saying here, that happens already in the UK. So we have uh, cohorts doing investment banking, doing international management, management, and we have a lot of them are Chinese, and then some of them are British, and some of them are European. The levels, the language level varies incredibly between them. Okay. And so what we are doing is working with lecturers, subject lecturers, to help them make their lectures, their courses more comprehensible. Um, one of the implications, though, is are we just teaching a British curriculum? I mean, you know, these Chinese students come all the way to the UK, do they just want a British curriculum? Or do they want an international curriculum? One which doesn't just talk about the context in the UK, it talks about the wider contexts. And I think the answer has to be, it talks about the wider contexts. So whether you're teaching pharmacy or chemistry or architecture <coughs> or engineering or whatever, you can't root it completely in a UK context or in a local context. That for me is not international. That for me is delivering a British syllabus to international students. It's not international education. Something to think about. But teachers may have to do a lot of things. Teachers, I'm talking about teachers of, whether it's native speaker teachers of English or non-native speakers uh, of English. We have to, all of us, we have to modify our language. Am I modifying my language when I'm talking to you now? What do you think? Am I making allowances for you? Do you think I'm doing anything different? Is this the way I would talk to my wife? Not yet, my wife, Timon, knows this story. Um, but do you think I'm talking normally? Is this the way I talk down the pub? What do you think? Does it seem like normal English? Some people are shaking their heads, some people are nodding their heads. Uh, it may be modified. I think, I think it is slightly modified, and we'll talk about how you modify 
your language. I would modify my language a great deal more if I were talking to students at the University of Reading, which includes international students. I'd be modifying it much, much more than I am at the moment. Yeah? But we have to learn how to do this, and we have to consider, I think, modifying our lecture style. Yeah? I mean, this is very much a lecture style, isn't it? I mean, I'm standing here, you know, working my throat, working, you know, whatever, and you guys are sitting there, um, well, you're, you're looking very attentive, which, thank you, thank you for looking attentive. I've got no idea what's going on in your brains, you know, and clearly what is not happening here, happening here is there, there's no interactivity. I mean, I've, I've thrown out a few questions, like, you know, but uh, there's been very little interactivity. I haven't asked you to talk about things um, in groups. I haven't asked you to do any preparation for this lecture. I haven't asked you to do any reading before this lecture. I'm not asking you to solve a problem now and then report back to me. Okay, so this lecture is the traditional lecture. This would not have looked out of place in the 14th or 15th century in Europe, okay, where lecture actually derives from the Latin word meaning to read, to read aloud. Yeah, okay, in Italian it's legere, okay, to read. And it's lecture derives from that word. So it's reading aloud almost to a group of people. Okay? And I think we have to consider modifying our lecture style because it may not work so well. It may not work particularly well with you know, native students of English. Okay? But it certainly doesn't work very well for international students whose first language is not English. And there has been research done in Australia about how much of lectures students understand. And what they did was they, well, they did lots of research, lots of interviews, lots of recordings, lots of questionnaires, stuff like that. And they were mixed groups, so there were Australians, first language English, there were internationals, second, third language English, etc., etc. And they said, well, how many of those students understood the lectures very well? Yeah? So that was the question, how many of you understood the lectures very well? Well, not very much, yeah? And when I looked at the statistics, I expected to see that the native students would say, very well, it would be, you know, 80, 90 percent. It was 33 percent. 33 percent of those Australian students whose first language was English understood the lectures very well. The other 67 percent understood it well or not so well. Now, that was a scary piece of research. And I think it, it's a message to us as lecturers that it's not just for international students that we may have to teach our approach. It may be for local students as well, that we're talking, we're lecturing, as we have done for 500, 600 years. But is it the best way of helping people learn the subject? And my answer to that would be, I don't know, but we need to look at it. And we need to look at other ways of doing it. Yeah. Now, where are we? Big implication, we may have to reduce the amount of material we cover in class, yeah? Because if we're changing our lecture style, if we're speaking more slowly, if we're giving students time, little kind of uh, time out sessions, you know, I should really give you a time out session now and say, okay guys, talk to each other and discuss anything that has come up, anything that I have said, or anything that you're not clear about, talk in your groups about this, just clarify your understanding. I'm not going to do that because we've actually just run out of time anyway, but if I do that, and that's what I would normally do in a lecture, then I cannot cover in the lecture hall as much material as I did in the 15th century when I was just lecturing to them, and who cares if they understood it or not. So we may have to look at you know, how we deliver some of the content of our course, not face-to-face -face through lectures, but before the lectures, after the lectures, whatever. So it comes back to the same idea. We have to modify our English, we have to modify our language level, and we have to look at ways of making the subject matter um, more learnable okay, by students, not just delivering like this in the lecture theatre. Yeah? Now, I realize that actually, literally, the time has just run out, and I've only got about through two of the slides, but I think I have made most of the points that I wanted to make anyway. And that is, we need not just to speak English, because English is the lingua franca at the moment. I mean, who knows? I mean, the, the title of this conference is, you know, where the hell is the world going? Okay, it's not where the hell is the world going, but that's the idea. Where are we going? Yeah? And so I'm not going to stand here and say that you know, EMI is the future. The E 
the E may not be there in 100 years' time or 50 years' time. It might be Chinese as a medium of instruction. Or, God forbid, Russian as a medium of instruction. I love Russian, but, you know, the politics would frighten me. Uh, or Arabic as a medium of instruction. I'm not saying it has to be E, but I think it is important that there is a lingua franca there. And whatever that language is, we have to learn how to use it better. Not just to speak it ourselves, but learn how to modify it so that it is comprehensible to our audience. I think all of you today, and you, I've looked at the, the presentations you're going to do, and they really, some of them, I thought, my God, I understand the titles. <laughs> I'm really good about that. Others, I looked at them and thought, I know the words. <laughs> I just have no idea what this is going to be about, you know, because... Understanding scientific presentations is not simply speaking that language, it's speaking the language of science as well, okay, which I don't speak very well. I speak the language of humanities and so forth. Yeah. That's another discourse that we can come to. And modifying our language, thinking about how we teach, how we deliver lectures. Do we deliver lectures? Do we do other things? I think we need to consider this as we go forward. In your presentations today, I'm sure you will make them comprehensible to the listeners. I'm sure you will, and I'm sure we are all going to enjoy it. I know that I will. I'm particularly looking forward to the ones that things like depression. Oh, yes, I've been there. I think I can understand that. I hope to learn from it. But lots of other presentations as well that really intrigue me. Okay, so um, I, like Tim on, like everyone else here, I'm sure, is looking forward to the rest of the day. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention, and enjoy your day. Any questions? Comments? Yes. Yes. Um, I come from India and all of my primary education and everything was in English. Yeah. So I already am in the EMI, but the downside of it, I wasn't even aware of it when I was going through my education. Sure. But I spent some time in Greece and Cyprus. Yeah. And over there the medium of instruction is Greek. Yeah. And people read probably hundreds of books in Greek. Yeah. And I have probably read 10 books in Hindi, no, 10 in my mother tongue, yeah. probably two in my, in Hindi. Yeah. So, uh, is there any long term uh, effects, uh, is there any study made in how this will affect probably two generations of the line? Maybe some language may die out. I, I think it's a major concern for people who are interested in multilingualism, um, because we don't want this to be at the expense of the local language. And, and you're absolutely right, there are people around the world, maybe academics particularly, who can talk about their subject in English, but actually find it difficult to switch back to their first language. Because some of the words, some of the phrases will be so common to them that they wouldn't even be able to translate it into their L1. I think we have to do whatever it takes to preserve local languages and Hindi it's, it's not a minority language is it you know? I mean it's a bloody big language so I don't think it will die out I think minority languages are more at risk and as a as a university that believes in multilingualism we don't want to promote lingual a sort of linguistic imperialism and I hope that's not what I seem to be doing today we are promoting multilingualism and we need to be multilingual as, as well as the rest of the world. You know? I don't think that's a lesson the English have still to learn. Yeah. Uh, but, that's it. but thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah. One more? Yes? Yeah. Can you say a few words about differences between modifications you make towards this particular group and uh, international students from Reading? Yeah, I mean, I would. I mean, I, I, I really, you know, don't want I have a slide, though, which talks about. Um, a study done on a lecture that was given in, in Birmingham University, and the same, the same, same, nothing is ever the same, obviously, but the same content lecture was delivered to Italian students in the University of Bologna. And they studied the two language, the two lectures to see what was the difference. And one of the differences, of course, was the speed of delivery. Because in the UK, it was something like 180 words per minute. In Italy, it was 125. Now, I mean, that's a hell of a difference, right? If you're going to slow your delivery rate down by one-third, then that has implications for the amount of content. 
I don't think, I mean, I don't know, they can play back the recording if, if someone really wants to and, you know, use some software and how many words per moment per minute was I using. I don't think it was 180, but it certainly wasn't 120, you know, so, but there was a slight modification. I also um, tried to restrict the number of idioms or idiomatic phrases that I was using, so maybe one or two I used, but I was avoiding others. I was also being much clearer in my pronunciation than, than, than I would be normally because the research into English as a lingua franca, which is E-L-F, okay? So we had E-M-I, English as a medium of instruction, English as a lingua franca, E-L-F, uh, because most of the conversations in English around the world at this moment don't involve British people or American people or Canadians or whatever. They're between, you know, uh, people from Japan and people from Poland, yeah? So, you know, that's, an, English is a lingua franca. What happens there? And where do the misunderstandings occur? You know, do the misunderstandings occur because of grammar, because of vocabulary, or because of pronunciation? What do you think? Of those three, you know, grammar mistakes, do they make a problem? Or is it lexis, vocabulary, is it pronunciation? Which of those three do you think is the most uh, disruptive? Yeah, like about 80% of the misunderstandings they recorded in that one particular piece of research were due to pronunciation. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to make my pronunciation much clearer. I mean, where do you think I'm from? UK, yeah, it's too big a term. Okay, UK, I probably did say that, yeah. And which part of the UK? Are you sure it's the UK? Does my accent sound particularly British? No, a couple of nods, shakes, whatever, yeah. I mean, I'm originally from Belfast in Northern Ireland, but a lot of people think I'm from the United States or Australia. You know, I, I say, well, the reason is that because the Irish travelled all over the world, right? The Irish had to leave Ireland because there were no jobs, no potatoes, no food, whatever, and the English were there, so the Irish had to move somewhere else, yeah? And so the Irish accents have influenced the world, you know? But my accent, when I speak to any group of people, is going to be slightly more clearer, more precise, I think, less lazy. Yeah. Last night, when I was downing a vodka with Tim on, it was much more relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, once again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So, we are ready to start the first session. It's a polar session. Yes? Ladies, please. Uh, we have introduced one one thing this year, uh, we have anonymous uh, uh, questioners that will randomly give before each presentation and people will just mark their, their ideas, if they like it, what they didn't like and then the, the presenter will get this information after the presentation, okay? So it's, it's just for your benefit, we hope. If you don't like it, you can throw it away. They're anonymous. They're just questions about you know, the, the form of presentation, the language, sort of like what Colin said to us. Uh, we hope to, it will be helpful for you. But of course, just like I said, it's up to you. You get it, you do whatever you want. It's not going into the TV, it's not going anywhere. It's just for you, okay? So I hope you, you like it. So,
firstly, I wanted to say that I'm sorry for my English. If you don't understand, but then I say I will modify my English for you. <laughs> so uh, I want to show you uh, the results of uh, mine and uh, my friend Cornelia work during uh, summer season 2017. Uh, on Polar Station uh, on Cafiera, it's uh, northwestern Spitsbergen. It's, uh, I'm going to talk about spatial and temporal variability of high Arctic glacier station uh, based on the example of, of the Valdemarbrin and Irenebrin. Uh, firstly, I will say something about uh, the aim, the scope, the methods of research. Uh, the definition of uh, ablation uh, and uh, also characteristics of Svalbard, uh, Cafiera region and uh, Valdemar Green because I were doing research on Valdemar Green uh, and the climate of uh, Cafiera, the long term changes uh, of ablation uh, of the Valdemar Green. It was uh, 1996 to uh, 2009, uh, and short-term changes in ablation uh, of Valdemar Green and Irene Green, like I said, in uh, season 2017. It was summer season. Uh, and firstly, ablation is uh, the main cause of uh, uh, disappearance of large masses of ice. Uh, on Cafiera, the first research was uh, conducted uh, in uh, 1996 by Grzesz and uh, Sobota. Uh, so it's over uh, 20 years now. Uh, and the results of uh, ablations in selected points of the Valdemar Green uh, in summer season, that's my mistake, it should be 2017. Uh, with the background of weather condition uh, registered by automatic weather station uh, named Hobo, uh, it's uh, located uh, near the glacier, uh, so these results will be presented. Uh, and there was an att attempt uh, to determine the significance of the local conditions of the Valdemar Green uh, and the um, uh, meteorological situation for the size and uh, intensity of ablation uh, to formulate conclusions regarding the con uh, co connection of progressive transformations in the cryosphere with current climate changes. And on the uh, figure you can see uh, the locations of the stakes on Valdemar Green. Uh, we're measuring uh, every five to seven days uh, how um, how much ice was melted, uh, and uh, we're measuring those stakes uh, to know uh, how uh, how large was the ablation. Uh, there was the interpolation uh, to the whole area of the Valdemar Green and Irene Green, uh, and then ice loss is converted into an equivalent of water. Uh, and you can see that the most common value for ice density is uh, 19, uh, uh, 917 uh, kilograms per uh, cubic meter. Uh, while uh, uh, while it's, it is a little bit uh, less for old snow and uh, fresh snow. And like I said, there were uh, 22 stakes uh, installed on Valdemar Green and measure it, uh, we're measuring it every five to uh, seven days. Uh, the whole concept of uh, ablation, definition of ablation, we can divide ablation uh, into uh, physical ablation and also uh, mechanical. Uh, physical ablation uh, is uh, covering processes of uh, surface mate, uh, melting and uh, sublimation of snow and ice, also evaporation of meltwater uh, and uh, mechanical waters, which involves uh, blowing snow from the surface of glacier, landslides separating dead ice and uh, calving glacier, uh, when we are talking about shelf glacier. Uh, we can uh, see the glacial zone, uh, like on the figure. Uh, uh, they are existing on every glacier. Uh, firstly, uh, we, we have a line of uh, s uh, snow, 
than uh, slash. Uh, and there, there are also avalanches of slash. It's uh, ice cover. Uh, and then we have uh, ablation zone. And uh, about uh, Svalbard. Svalbard archipelago extends from uh, 74 uh, degree to 81 uh, degree longitude. Uh, and uh, 10 to uh, uh, 35 east longitude. Uh, the total area of archipel archipelago is over 61,000 uh, square kilometers. Uh, the largest island, uh, island is, of course, uh, Spitsbergen. Uh, Spitsbergen, there are also North Auslandet, Ejoya, Barentsoya, and other smaller islands. And uh, you can see the figure of uh, Cafeira, where is located our station. Uh, our station is uh, named Hahut, uh, and uh, it's located on Kafira Plain uh, in the northern part of East uh, Oscar uh, Land uh, in northwestern part of Spitsbergen. <coughs> uh, and uh, like I said, it, w it is the largest island of Svalbard. Uh, we can uh, see the uh, glaciers on the Kafira Plain. It is uh, Valdemar Breen, Irene Breen, uh, Elise Breen, which is the largest, uh, Ivin Breen, Andreas Breen, Oliver Breen, Avatsmar Breen, and Dal Breen. Avatsmar Breen and Dal Breen are uh, shelf uh, glaciers. And uh, maybe, I don't know if you uh, know what is Breen. Breen stands for glacier in uh, Norwegian. But uh, doing research, we also use uh, the name Breen instead of Glacier. Uh, the characteristic of Valdemar Breen, uh, you can see the Valdemar on this uh, photograph. It's a small Alpine Valley glacier. Uh, it's uh, limited by priest Heidrich Fiela uh, and Grofielet, and behind Grofielet is Irana Breen. Uh, the northern part, the biggest you can see, is uh, active, and the southern part, uh, part is dying. Uh, uh, Valdemar Glacier, of course, uh, retreats in uh, last decades. Uh, it has one uh, cirque uh, and a glacier uh, tongue, uh, as you can see, uh, and uh, it's uh, about uh, uh, 3,5 kilometers long and one kilometer uh, wide. Uh, Valdemar Breen uh, consists uh, numerous shallow superglacial uh, streams, uh, which also affects the ablation, and I'm gonna mention that later. Uh, you can see the climate uh, of the Kafira region. Uh, its uh, average uh, per year is uh, minus uh, five uh, degrees uh, Celsius degrees, and uh, minimum was in 1988, it was uh, minus 8,5 Celsius degree, and maximum in 2015, uh, 2,4 Celsius degree. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there is uh, over upward uh, trend. Uh, you can see also long-term changes uh, in ablation uh, atmospheric conditions. Uh, in the 1996-2009, uh, uh, and you can see that average uh, was uh, minus uh, 4,5 uh, Celsius degree. The warmest year was 2006, and the coldest uh, 1998. Uh, and also uh, the trend uh, is increasing. Uh, the precipitation uh, a little bit downward trend. Uh, the lowest precipitation uh, was in the year with the highest temperature uh, in 2006 uh, and maximum in 2002. Uh, and about ablation. Uh, ablation of the Valdemar Breen uh, in, 2000, uh, in 1996 to 2009. Uh, you can see that at the beginning of the season, the ablation is uh, quite low, but, but then it reaches, uh, it's not peak, but uh, it's increasing. Then uh, also it's uh, decreasing, and 
Uh, in the middle of the season, uh, there is uh, maximum of ablation, and then it's slowly decreasing. Uh, also, you can see uh, the three uh, figures. Uh, the first is ablation zone, the second is equilibrium zone when uh, ablation is uh, uh, the same as uh, accumulation, and uh, the uh, third figure where it's uh, accumulation zone. And uh, you can see that ablation is uh, beginning uh, earlier uh, at the ablation zone than uh, at the accumulation zone, and it's uh, uh, much larger. Uh, you can see also the uh, changes in ablation uh, in these years uh, uh, in Valdemar Breen. The average summer balance of uh, Valdemar uh, Glacier uh, is minus uh, 106,9 uh, centimeters of water equivalent. And the largest loss uh, mm, in mass uh, of the glacier was observed in 2009 and the uh, smallest in uh, 2000. Uh, on this uh, figure, uh, you can see the interpolation of the ablation uh, in uh, 1996 to uh, 2009. Uh, the first figure is uh, minimum uh, values of ablation, the, se the second is average uh, values of ablation, and the third maximum values of ablation. Uh, and uh, as you can see on these figures, uh, uh, the smallest ablation is in the accumulation zone, it's in uh, Glacier Sear. Uh, and uh, the highest values are on the uh, forehead of Glacier, it's almost uh, 160 centimeters of water equivalent. Uh, so I will speed up, sorry. Uh, so let's move to uh, 2017. Uh, the average daily temperature was uh, 5,4 uh, degrees uh, Celsius degree, uh, so it was a bit larger than the average. Uh, so let's uh, let's don't talk about the wind and the maximum and minimum temperature. And we can see the ablation uh, of the Valdemar Breen uh, and the stakes uh, and the uh, mean daily temperature, how it changes. It, in, it was changing uh, like in this uh, years 1996 to 2009, but uh, in the middle of, uh, of uh, August, there was uh, a precipitation of snow and the ablation uh, rapidly uh, decreased. So the ablation was uh, a little bit smaller. And you can see uh, the uh, spatial uh, ablation. The highest values uh, was on the forehead and uh, the smallest uh, in the ice circ, like I said, uh, it was uh, about uh, 20 uh, centimeters uh, about, uh, I'm sorry, about 77,2 uh, 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 centimeters of water equivalent. And you can see overall uh, season, uh, the uh, remaining area glacier was dominated by values greater than 100 centimeters of water equivalent. So the ablation was uh, really large in the season. And uh, there are also uh, on Irena Bruin, and I'm gonna skip this a little bit. You can see the spatial uh, changes in ablation on uh, Irena Bruin. It was uh, like uh, on Valdemar, uh, the maximum values in the uh, forehead and the minimum in the uh, in this, uh, glacier cirque. You can see the overall season. Uh, 2017 uh, maximum uh, 128 centimet uh, centimeters, that was maximum and minimum uh, 43 centimeters of water equivalent. And uh, coming to conclusions, uh, as you can see, the ablation uh, is the indicator of changes of cryosphere, is largely dependent on atmospheric conditions. Uh, the large, uh, the average daily temperature was uh, a little bit higher than the average. 
uh, so the climate change uh, really occurs and you can see it uh, in uh, glacier glaciered areas like uh, Cafeira uh, where uh, Valdemar Brin and Irene Brin are retreating very rapidly uh, and uh, the most important uh, conditions of glaciers uh, have an impact on the intensity of ablation and it's uh, exposure, shading, slope, and uh, morphometric features, uh, and also uh, moraine material. And we need to, uh, doing re we need to do research about ablation in uh, next years to see the global changing and uh, the changing of the landscape, uh, especially in Arctic. Thank you, Marta, for your presentation. Uh, we have time only for one question. I would like to ask you about uh, what is the annual amount of uh, withdrawal of the glacier? Well, uh, the results for Irene Green and Vladimir Green is similar. Uh, so it's about uh, 12 meters per year for Vardemar and for Iran Green. Thank you. Thank you once again. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Veronika Pokuła from uh, University of Gdańsk. Veronika, the floor is yours. because it is uh, the basic uh, food supply for many organisms such as, such as uh, fishes uh, and the bigger <coughs> ones as well. Uh, and uh, they uh, also connecting the primary producers uh, which the hydrotrophic lower organisms. Uh, <coughs> also, I would like to mention that the climate changes nowadays we observe uh, in the world it is uh, most visible in the polar regions, uh, and that's, uh, it is important to know how the structure of zooplankton is forming uh, <coughs> in these ecosystems, uh, because uh, some of these organisms are uh, good indicators uh, 
of this uh, global climate changes uh, and uh, based on the structure of them we can uh, we can then uh, connect it, uh, these changes to the climate uh, change in these ecosystems and moving forward uh, the aims of these studies was to analyze and define the mesoscale variability of zooplankton in an arctic fjord both in their taxonomic level and uh, their quantitative uh, composition. And the second one was to assess a possible impact of environmental <coughs> condition on zooplankton diversity and presence of meroplankton larvae. Uh, so maybe we could, uh, based on that, uh, connect this uh, changes, the variability of zooplankton with the climate change uh, in these ecosystems. Uh, our research uh, was conducted in Isfjorden. It is one of the uh, three major fjords uh, in the Spitsbergen, uh, the biggest uh, island of the Svalbard. Uh, the Isfjorden is uh, almost the largest one of the fjords, uh, and uh, his uh, and his mouth is uh, quite uh, broad. So uh, it is uh, quite. Uh, it is very influenced by the inflows of uh, the Atlantic waters, relatively Atlant uh, warmer Atlantic waters, which are carried with the uh, West Spitsberger current into the fjord, which comes uh, from the northern. Uh, they penetrate the fjord and uh, outflows at the mm, northern side. Uh, so this is important to know uh, how this uh, how these Atlantic waters influenced uh, the structure of zooplankton community in this fjord. And uh, we designated uh, 10 stations in this fjord, uh, which are uh, in the nested triangles. Uh, on this map, we don't see it clearly, but when we zoom in uh, at this fjord, we see how it should like. Uh, so we see there are three triangles uh, based on eight, uh, nine stations, and the uh, Tenth one is inside of these triangles. Uh, moving forward, uh, <coughs> we go to the uh, specify the materials and methods uh, in which we uh, collect the samples. Uh, all of the samples was uh, collected uh, at 10th and 11th of August in 2016 uh, from 10 stations uh, during the uh, Erfa Oceania cruise uh, at uh, three samples at each on one. Uh, the whole samples was uh, collected by different layers, uh, which was based on water properties. Uh, all of these properties, uh, temperature and salinity, salinity was measured by the CTD. Uh, and the maximal, uh, maximum depth of one of the station was 260 meters. Uh, all of these samples was collected uh, by the plankton net, uh, uh, of uh, 180 micrometers mesh size. <coughs> Going to environmental background, uh, we see uh, all of these profiles. We see the, uh, clearly the um, occurrence of thermocline and halocline, all of these profiles. And going from uh, right side to the left, uh, these two stations, we see uh, they are different and this uh, could be caused by uh, uh, by being uh, of the station nearly to the land. Uh, this is the station IE2 uh, and IF1, and we see uh, they are uh, near to the shore. Uh, and the <coughs> profile from the station IX, uh, I6 uh, is similar to the rest of uh, one, uh, the station. Uh, this is the uh, distance uh, based uh, redundancy analysis on which we see uh, the uh, division of uh, the our samples based on the layers which they come uh, from uh, and we see the uh, groups into uh, they connecting uh, into two groups uh, the surface groups is uh, different from uh, others, but what we see for these uh, two um, 
for this group, we see clearly that uh, they also connecting into two smaller groups uh, based on uh, the layers which they come from. Uh, next one, uh, uh, distance uh, based redundancy analysis was, uh, uh, was done uh, according to the taxonomic uh, composition uh, of the samples. And uh, here we see uh, the division of the three main groups, the surface layer group, the intermediate layer group, and the deep layer group. And uh, according to the anosim uh, analysis, uh, all of <coughs> these groups are, uh, the division of all of these uh, groups are uh, stati statistically uh, significant. And in the surface layer among the domain taxa uh, was, uh, for example, Limacina helicina, Cleona limacina, uh, Copepoda naupli, or Oitona similis. And the intermediate uh, groups, the main taxa was Microcalanus. Uh, <coughs> species and in the deep layer group, uh, the main taxa occurring there uh, was Calanus glacialis, Calanus hyperboreus, uh, the individuals of the family of Atidaida from stage one to three, and uh, also Metridia longa. <coughs> and now we see graphically uh, the division uh, of our samples, and here we also see uh, that they are divided into four groups. Uh, and based uh, on the SIMPROF test, uh, these groups are uh, stati statistically, statistically significant. <coughs> Going further, uh, now I represent uh, the um, proportion of holoplankton and meroplankton in our samples. Uh, and what we see is that uh, in every layer at each station, uh, the proportion of meroplankton to holoplankton is very small. Uh, only at the station I4 and IE2 uh, in the surface layer, this proportion are much bigger and also in the deep layer at station I4. Uh, here is the relative uh, composition of taxonomic composition mm, uh, of our samples. And what is important, uh, we see that in the surface layer, the <coughs> among the dominant uh, taxa in abundance are uh, Limacina helicina uh, and also the Oitona similis. Uh, in the intermediate layers, uh, there are uh, Pseudocalanus species uh, and also Oitona similis. We also see the small proportion of uh, Microcalanus species. Uh, and in the deep layer, uh, we see uh, the uh, domain taxa is uh, Calanus glacialis with small proportion of uh, Pseudocalanus species. Uh, also, what we see in this uh, figures is that uh, only in two stations, uh, IF1 and IE2, uh, at all of layers, there is a different situation uh, in which we see the dominant taxa in the surface layer uh, are Oitona similis, uh, Bivalvia veligers at station IE2, uh, and also Limacina helicina. In the intermediate layers, uh, mainly Oitona similis, and in the deep layer, <coughs> uh, also Oitona similis with small proportion of Pseudocalanus species. Uh, this could be caused by the uh, uh, by that this uh, station are near to the shore and maybe some uh, factors could influence on this. Uh, going further, I represent the um, zoo geographical uh, composition of holoplankton at each station. Uh, and what we see in every layer is the dominance of boreal and uh, boreal-arctic species. Uh, so it could be caused by the influence of uh, West Spitsbergen current, uh, which, uh, which carried uh, within the relatively Atlantic, what relatively warmer Atlantic waters, which inflow uh, to the fjord and penetrate it. Uh, so the water masses uh, mixing all uh, around, and uh, maybe it goes by this. Uh, to summary and conclusion, uh, the most important is. We could say the mesoscale of plankton variability is connected uh, to physical 
chemical uh, water condition as temperature and salinity, and also, as I mentioned uh, previously, also with death. Uh, it is important that it is very small proportion of meroplankton in total. Uh, it is uh, it may cause the um, harmful uh, influence on benthic communities. Uh, among dominant taxa uh, at each layers uh, was Limatina helicina, Oitona similis, Pseudocalamus species, Calamus glacialis, occurring in each layer, as I mentioned previously, uh, talking about the result. Uh, we also uh, see the significant input of boreal and boreal arctic species in our samples. And uh, I think what is the most important, it is uh, rare presence of uh, Calanus glacialis in the surface layer uh, because it has uh, implication for little ox. Uh, it is that because uh, Calanus glacialis is a main food for little ox because of uh, highly lipid, lipid uh, in it. And if uh, there is not Calanus glacialis in the surface layer where the little ox uh, dived uh, looking for the food, uh, it has implication, for example, for breeding. Uh, ecology of them or uh, feeding the young, uh, also for the uh, taking the guano ashore to the land. And uh, that's all I would like to present today for you and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. Any questions? So to uh, find some homogeneous subsets within your data set, you used uh, cluster analysis? Yes. Okay. Yes. Based on break artist similarity. Did you consider any other um, measures of similarity? Uh, at uh, that moment, I, know, I don't, but maybe in the further analysis, I would like to find some other. Any questions? So, thank you very much, Veronica. And now, Joanna Michalak from Nicolas Copernicus University will be talking about earth science and foresting investigation, topic full of con uh, contradictions. The time is short, so let's uh, get to this. Uh, first, let's see where uh, the... Uh, okay, the topic is about earth sciences in the forensic investigations. So uh, we have uh, two uh, disciplines uh, that are, uh, as we can see, uh, we will see in a moment, uh, far away from each other, uh, even in classifications. Because first, let's see, uh, we have earth sciences. Earth sciences. Uh, and here the division is clear. We got uh, the science connected to atmosphere, geology, so rocks, and hydrology. Then uh, a bit further away we have uh, one more thing. In uh, agricultural science we have soil science, which is uh, also a very important part of uh, earth sciences. And then far, far away we have in uh, but uh, look at this discipline, it's not science and engineering fields. So it's classified as not even science. So here we have forensic science and technology. Uh, but uh, uh, despite this, uh, mm, this distance, uh, there is uh, already a classifications uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, somehow defines uh, so, uh, sub-disciplines uh, uh, in, uh, in this... Uh, okay. Uh, uh, 
uh, we have um, just uh, using earth sciences in forensic investigation already have uh, sub-disciplines and uh, here we have uh, from the uh, narrowest term forensic geoscience and here we have uh, uh, some science uh, connected strongly to the ground to the earth, sur earth surface when we add to this uh, geomorphology uh, gis and remote sensing and even human geography we have geoforensics and the broadest term, so environmental forensics, uh, we have when we uh, get uh, geoforensics and add uh, some more uh, fields from uh, earth sciences like climatology, meteorology, and hydrology, and chemistry, biology, and physics. Uh, this four I will talk later, uh, so just remember it. It's uh, meteorology, hydrology, forensic pathology, and forensic geology. Uh, so uh, maybe first uh, let's get back to uh, the beginning because uh, the history of this field is uh, is not that short. Uh, it starts over uh, over a hundred years ago. Uh, here we have the first uh, one of the first works uh, about using earth materials in forensic science. It was uh, the history about the train who uh, a train that uh, was carrying uh, coins. Uh, but uh, when this uh, train arrived to the station, uh, it turns out that somewhere along the way, the coins were, uh, uh, were missing, and uh, instead of them, uh, there were rocks inside of uh, this, uh, this wagons. So uh, uh, specialists had to, uh, had to check where along the way of this train the, those rocks uh, were, uh, were placed, and then he find the, where the thief I were, was hiding. Um, here, uh, maybe you uh, know this, uh, this man, this man, uh, uh, because uh, uh, even in uh, pop culture back then, um, the uh, uh, geoforensics was mentioned, because even in uh, um, books, one of books about Sherlock Holmes, uh, the main character uh, solved the mystery using a mat from the shoe of, uh, of, uh, of some guy. <laughs> and here we have a very important man. Uh, this is uh, Edmund Lockhart. And uh, he, uh, he came up with his, uh, uh, ex with his exchange print principle, uh, which means every contact leaves a trace. So uh, it, so the basis for uh, matching these two disciplines were established as soon as in the 19th century and it was more than 100 years ago. And, but look now uh, at these graphs. Uh, those graphs are, uh, showing, uh, are showing how many times in publications uh, those disciplines were mentioned. Uh, and as you can see, uh, it was the last like, 15 years uh, where they really flourished. So uh, despite uh, this uh, discipline showed up so long ago, uh, it is now uh, where, when uh, it has uh, its time, really. Uh, so, uh, okay, it uh, appeared 100 years ago, now it's flourished, so what's the problem? Problem is in approach. Here we have geograph geographical approach. Uh, it's all about making uh, models, uh, making simplifications, uh, making generali generalizations. Uh, it started with, uh, with this man here. Uh, he's Alexander von Humboldt, and he writes uh, his Cosmos, and, uh, in which uh, he uh, collected uh, all the possible geograph geographical uh, knowledge at, uh, from, this, uh, from his time, and he just simplified it made the generalization and that uh, and that's how it is uh, that's how it is now uh, how geography works from from his time to now but here we have a forensic science approach they are all about particles S single particles like, like this potential gunshot residue particle uh, every hair every uh, piece of dust so uh, at uh, this moment, those two disciplines doesn't have to, uh, doesn't really have to uh, 
work together very well, uh, but, but it works. I have a few examples here. Uh, first, meteorology. First of those four disciplines I showed at the beginning. Uh, uh, first, uh, first thing. Uh, let's think about uh, cadaver decomposition. Uh, it depends. Uh, it depends strongly on activity of uh, of little creature, creatures like these maggots or bacteria. But what? Uh, but this activity is not always the same. Yeah, exactly. They uh, like when it's warm. They like when it's humid. Uh, that's when uh, the composition will be the fastest. So how meteorology can help? We have. Something that is really functioning now, ADD, or accumulated degree days. It's a uh, time uh, from, the, uh, from that uh, that uh, is uh, connected to uh, the daily temperature because you know, the higher temperature, the faster the, faster, uh, the composition will, will be. And second, part, uh, second thing, humidity and uh, in case of humidity, we can uh, just take data from meteor meteorological stations, uh, but uh, it, and it will be good when the uh, cadaver is on the uh, on the surface. But if it is uh, under the ground, we can also use satellite images that are showing, for example, vegetation, because uh, the condition of, veg of vegetations of these plants uh, would uh, say us. Uh, how uh, humid is the ground? Next thing, hydrology. Because it is good to know how stream works, where the, it goes fastest, where it goes slower, uh, because uh, in the places where it goes slower, it drops things that, he, uh, that it uh, took uh, earlier. It was uh, the example, is case of Lisa Silvers, uh, we, and she was uh, found dead in the stream, and due to advanced decomposition, her teeth uh, were missing, and uh, those teeth were uh, crucial to uh, ident identify her. So uh, the specialist who, uh, who were uh, identifying her uh, just had to search for those teeth, and he had to know where to find it, just where the stream was the lowest, uh, had the lowest flow. Next thing. Uh, uh, this is forensic geology, and this is a very broad term with uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, problems because um, match just simple matching uh, samples from, for example, uh, shoes of, uh, of suspect to the sample of ground from, uh, uh, from a specific area uh, sounds simple, but it isn't. Look just, uh, for example, uh, at, at the mm, grain size. Uh, in, uh, in, the, um, in the field, we, have, uh, we can have um, larger particles like gravel, but, uh, not always, uh, but not all of these particles are sticking to the shoe. So first we have a problem about uh, the particle size distribution and, um, and the there's uh, some more, but uh, uh, forensic geology can uh, use a lot of uh, techniques that uh, geologists uh, already used, like uh, electron microscopy or uh, X-ray analysis. Uh, the list of an analysis is uh, really, really long, uh, but uh, I have to mention this one very specific, very uh, interesting, uh, I think, work. Uh, that is uh, characterization of soils from the Curitiba metropolitan re region uh, for forensic purposes. And it's about uh, creating a da database for minerals from specific area to, uh, to simplify the process. For example, when, uh, when suspect has something on his shoe, uh, we can have uh, uh, with, with this database, uh, mm, the place where we're from is this map, uh, can be easy, very easy uh, found. And last, uh, forensic pathology, uh, so uh, soil science. Uh, soil scientists have a lot of, um, 
have a lot of techniques to uh, spot, for example, uh, to spot in uh, soil uh, things like uh, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium. Uh, those are all elements that are very useful for plants, and uh, so uh, it is always, uh, usually, uh, mm, it, uh, it is useful in uh, uh, to assess uh, how plant will grow on this uh, on specific land, but uh, it can be uh, also used for forensic uh, purposes to spot, for example, cadaver decomposition island. It's a huge influx of uh, biogenic substances uh, that are uh, coming from uh, the composite cadaver. And uh, I want to say uh, one more thing about uh, about how it uh, functions about in uh, pop culture, because uh, uh, the uh, using earth sciences in forensic uh, uh, sci uh, in forensic practice uh, it works so good that it even appears uh, in TV shows. So uh, next to the guy that was identified uh, with four pixel photo, we have a guy who was identified um, by one grain of mineral. So okay, and uh, problems that can uh, appear are. Uh, that uh, in uh, in geographical sciences, uh, uh, so, uh, some soil samples uh, need a homogenization before uh, before measuring, whereas uh, in uh, forensic science, uh, mixing is uh, not allowed. Uh, the series of techniques may be dependent upon one another, whereas in forensic science, the techniques should be uh, independent and. Uh, there's uh, always also issue about uh, discrimination abilities of uh, particular analytical techniques, and uh, no, there is always this desire to match samples do during investigation because it's normal for scientists to uh, make a hypothesis. And conclusions: of course, there is a future in forensic science for earth sciences, uh, but techniques should be di diversified uh, and. Uh, mm, Maybe we should uh, sometimes uh, uh, invest in new, uh, in new equipment. And uh, databases are the future, like uh, databases of, uh, database of uh, temperature, humidity, uh, satellite photos, and uh, minerals, and so on. And all it needs to, chain, uh, to practice these disciplines uh, together, uh, it needs to be uh, it needs to change approach from generalizing to focusing on details. Sounds simple, but it's not always. Thank you. Thank you very much for interesting presentation. Uh, and the questions? Okay, so uh, our thank you very much, uh, Janna. Our next uh, s uh, speaker is uh, Katarzyna Dziembor from University of Gdańsk. Uh, the topic of Katarzyna's presentation is sea spray aerosol as a climate factor uh, in the modern society awareness. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Anja said, uh, my name is Katarzyna Dziembor. I'm studying. Uh, physical oceanography at the University of Gdańsk. Uh, my advisor is from Institute of Oceanology. And uh, uh, I can say I'm sick in uh, sea spray aerosols. And today, uh, on my presentation, uh, which I create with my colleague from CR Interaction Lab, Piotr Markuszewski, I want to say a few words about uh, sea spray aerosol as the climate factor in uh, modern society awareness. Okay, uh, I, mm, mm, at first I will say about my motivation to create this um, speech, then I tell uh, what is this sea spray aerosol, I will remind you, and how it gets to the atmosphere, uh, why it's climatically important, and I'll mm, describe our research area and methods and say what we are doing to share this knowledge to um, other people. Okay, so I think I just 
again. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, ways to get interesting information um, is uh, very easy. All of us has, uh, have computers and mobile phones. Uh, we can surf the net and search interesting information, uh, whatever it is. Uh, we search for um, funny cuts or global warming impact. And uh, uh, simultaneously, I, uh, I noticed that some people um, don't want to reach their knowledge and just, um, I don't know, just think that, that for example, Earth is flat or, or so on. And uh, I put uh, some websites here uh, when we can, where we can find uh, information about aerosols and uh, Earth's climate itself. And uh, yes, it was my main motivation. Okay, uh, sea spray aer aerosol, what is it? Uh, they are small, very small particles from about 10 nanometers to 50 micrometers um, in sizes particles, solid or liquid like sea salt or uh, seawater, um, and they appeared during uh, storms, both in the coastal and uh, offshore areas. Um, uh, and how they get to the atmosphere? Uh, we have, uh, we need uh, higher uh, wind speed about seven meters per second and uh, when the wind waves um, appears they are pushing under water surface uh, the air which going uh, which is going upwardly and creates a bubble on the surface um, then we can see uh, this bubbles bursting and uh, there appears small film droplets. Then when this cavity is closing, uh, we can see some bigger drops called jet drops. And the last part is uh, our spume drops when we have uh, white caps and wind is um, taking from the uh, waves crest some sea spray and they are the biggest one the lifetime in the atmosphere is the shortest because you know they are um, heavier than um, the other particles um, and why they are climatically important uh, we have uh, two main aerosols effects the first is uh, light scattering when we have uh, some particles between the sun and the air the light is mm, simply scattered on these uh, particles. And the second one is, uh, uh, is because of the fact that uh, sea salt, partic uh, salt particles are very hygroscopic and uh, they became cloud condensation nuclei and uh, form the clouds uh, which are changing the Earth's albedo and affect to the Mm, uh, mm, light budget and radiance processes and uh, we have to notice that uh, you know earth is in 70 percent covered by sea so uh, it shouldn't be a surprise that marine aerosols mm, uh, emission is uh, bigger than emission of uh, other um, sources like, I don't know, um, biomass burning, volcano eruptions, or, uh, uh, or, or dust. And it is continuous because emission um, happens all the time. Um, okay, uh, as I said, I, uh, aerosols are climatically important. So where we are conducting our measurements, we have two main areas. The first one is the Baltic Sea, mainly the mm, southern part, the Baltic proper. 
and sometimes other parts like uh, Gulf of Botnia when we are uh, last year. And the, mm, and the second area is uh, European Arctic, I mean Northern Sea and Greenland Sea and uh, fjords in Spitsbergen. Uh, we are conducting mm, uh, measurements during annual polar cruises. Uh, and how we exactly do it. Um, we have uh, some instruments placed on the measuring platform on the first of three masts on uh, our ship, Oceania. Um, uh, the platform is on uh, level eight meters above sea level and uh, we are measuring concentration of uh, particle sizes in uh, different ranges and we have other equipment like, mm, like here for example uh, sun photometers where, uh, which uh, mm, when we mm, measure the aerosol optical depth in the atmosphere um, mm, okay <laughs> there will be the last part uh, because I'm a bit stressed and I speak too fast. Uh, so, um, how we are sharing this knowledge to other people because this uh, sharing knowledge aren't only uh, conferences and articles. Uh, in Free City we had uh, some activities like Baltic Festival of Science or a long weekend in Science Center <coughs> in Gdynia on the way. Uh, when uh, everybody can ask why we are doing it, uh, what we are measure, what we are looking for, etc. And I think that uh, such activities are very interesting because we can go to people and talk about our uh, research. And tomorrow will be mm, uh, 11th Support Science Day, activity like this and you, uh, you can participate if you want. I think that the one will be happy. <laughs> so, um, and uh, we have also uh, smaller uh, events. Uh, I can see private events when we can uh, we go uh, with uh, uh, with presentations, non official, and talk strictly about aerosol, like. Uh, for example, yesterday when I was uh, in Gdańsk in, uh, uh, in the pub and we are talking about our research, uh, I make a presentation and it was quite nice. And I think that uh, sharing knowledge uh, about what we are doing is also uh, very important, especially now when um, global climate is changing so dynamically. So, um, mm, okay, I think that uh, I will thank you for your attention now. Thank you very much, Kasia. Any questions? <coughs> so, I have one question. Okay. Uh, could you uh, tell us how you perform the measurement of the aerosol Okay, we have uh, sun photometers, as I said, uh, microtops, and this is, um, mm, uh, you have to wait until you have clear sky without clouds because uh, we want to measure some uh, aerosols, not clouds, and you point this uh, uh, microtops to the sun and you have to be, um, stay without move and you know you are shooting to the sun and then you mm, mm, taking those data to the computer and uh, you can see how many aerosols was in the atmosphere in this uh, in this time <coughs> and in uh, and in which area because you taking also the data from the gps Short comment.
the broken arm is not related to the pub activity yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make it clear. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our last speaker of this session is uh, Damian Jasniewicz from our institute. Damian will take it about shallow gas and acoustic imaging for sediments of base. So, hello, uh, my name is Damian Wiesniewicz. I'm a PhD student in the Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Science. And today I have opportunity and great pleasure to present you a topic of shallow gas in acoustic imaging in the region of dense basin and uh, its changes throughout the years 2011-2017. Uh, so going straight to the introduction of the topic, there are a few gases that can be presented in the sediments, uh, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, or methane. Where for our studies and for acoustic detection, <coughs> the methane is most important. Uh, it is, it's had the weakest solubility, uh, and its presence can be also uh, indicated by geochemical uh, studies done in parallel parallel with uh, acoustic measurements. So why the map on the left, uh, left side? This map presents the sediments of Sounder Baltic Sea, to be specific, the region of Polish exclusive economic zone. And the sediments that are uh, connected with the presence of uh, methane, are mostly connected, are the clay and slits. So we concentrate only on this on this blue, uh, dark blue and bright blue regions, which indicate clays and slit, uh, slits. So, uh, when we see uh, we, uh, the variation of the sediments in this region, uh, then we can go to the concentrating <coughs> on the regions of, of study. So, two points, methane one and methane two. So, we can see that the proximity of these two points are, uh, is, is is close, uh, but it's not uh, always related to the similarity of results that I will present. And why the methane? Why to study the me methane? Methane is a very good indicator of the state of environment, uh, but because it's uh, connected with um, um, lack of oxygen near the um, bottom waters, it's also connected with the eutrophi eutrophization through primary production and orga organic uh, matter degradation. Uh, and going to the methods. Uh, the, I will discuss two methods. Uh, the geochemical methods that are presented on the right, uh, they are re uh, relay on the core sampling. Uh, core sample is presented on the right top picture it can uh, obtain one to 1 to 1.5 meters of uh, sediments. And at the right bottom, uh, there is presented the uh, sediment and pore water sampling for methane uh, analysis through syringes, put it in the core. And uh, then core also is divided into layers for additional analysis that can enrich, uh, enrich our studies. And from the acoustic uh, uh, point, we make measurements using uh, 20 kilohertz uh, single beam echo sounder, which can go uh, about even to 30 uh, meters in the soft se uh, sediments, if we assume the speed of sound is similar to the water. So the two, uh, two things that we have are uh, the uh, first echograms, and also the greater coverage of our region. So in terms of acoustic measurement, measurements, uh, we have greater coverage area. And in terms of uh, core samples and geo geochemical analysis, we have point data, but they're uh, more detailed. And uh, this slide presents the diversity of shallow gas in acoustic imaging in two regions, the methane one and methane two. But Oh, the, uh, the 
this is not good. It's not uh, synced properly. Okay, so I will start for quick course how to distinguish the gas uh, gas in the echograms. Uh, first of all, on the left echogram, uh, we can see uh, first in the middle there is a very distinct region when we have a stronger signal uh, than in these regions uh, and is uh, connected with a signal a stronger signal reflection, so layer enhancement, and also uh, the acoustic uh, blanking beneath it. So lack of data beneath the gas fronts. So this is the most obvious uh, part of it, but we can also observe it here, the uh, acoustic blanking. Here, uh, here also layer enhancement and acoustic blanking, and here, so four regions. So the region of central Gulf of Gdansk is, uh, have more uneven distribution of gas presence than comparing to the uh, western Gulf of uh, Gdansk, where uh, gas presence is indicated by acoustic blank in this region. So going to more detailed uh, analysis of uh, point methane one with more uneven distribution, this is location with history of uh, gas seeping. So uh, gas uh, is going from the sediments into the water. And on the right side, we have uh, methane profiles from three different years, 2009, 14, and 17. And what we can see on the first, uh, first insight that the profiles are very chaotic. And what are the explanations of, of this? And there can be few of them. Uh, the gas presence indicated by acoustic imaging is very strong, so it may lead to uneven gas distribution in the columnar sediments through the buoyancy of, of, of <coughs> gas. And also the sediments displacement connected also uh, with migration, uh, migration of gas. And another interesting aspect is the rapid decrease of methane in the year 2014 in the 30 uppermost centimeter, uh, centimeters of sediments. And this can be connected with uh, gas seeking or even gas evolution. So gas release to the water, uh, diminishing, uh, diminishing the amount of methane present in the sediment, sediments. Okay. And then I will talk about uh, point, uh, second point, methane two in the Bay. It had more uh, more homogeneous uh, um, manifestation of gas presence, but there are weaker than at methane one point. <coughs> uh, and uh, from the geochemical uh, analysis through the method methane profiles, we can see the decrease concentration of methane. Decrease of concentration because next slide. Characteristic of gas presence uh, change. Uh, so, the acoustic uh, acoustics maps presented uh, will be based on nine acoustics transects uh, uh, done in this region, and this gray underlying uh, map with, with stripes uh, it's gaseous sediments that are recognized in year 2011, and from this point uh, is obtaining the, the core sample. So how is the map is presenting, uh, comparing with the data from 2011 and 2017? Uh, don't be terrified. First of all, uh, the green one is uh, the most important. This is the region of uh, constant uh, occurrence of gas throughout the years. Uh, the orange region is second important. This is uh, the region with the new gas. So we can see that area of gas coverage is changing. And the red area indicates the area where the gas coverage is diminishing. And based on this, uh, this data, only this part of, uh, of data, we can also assume that uh, south from it, also the uh, methane concentration diminish. And uh, blue are the new data, so you can have uh, comparison. Yes, and if, uh, if we talk about uh, area coverage, uh, so uh, here are the areas where the, the 
there is a lack of gas, it's probably connected with the changing of sediments types. And here are uh, here is decreasing of, of depth, uh, which is also <coughs> may, may be uh, very uh, connected with, uh, with this issue. So if we if we talk about uh, coverage area changes, uh, we need to present some possible explanation. One of this explanation of why we observe such changes is the inflow that uh, take place in the year 2015 that may rapidly uh, change the conditions in the region. Another uh, another interesting uh, fact uh, is diminishing uh, methane. So faster faster uh, changes in time in this region may be also connected with smaller depth than at the station methane line. So this uh, leads to uh, better mixing of water uh, better mixing of water masses and supplying with the uh, oxygen. So this region in general may be more susceptible for changes and also currents may take So going to the conclusion, comparing these two regions, so methane 2 and methane 1, we can see that uh, changes at point methane uh, 1 are more, uh, more profound, are stronger, but the gas presence and concentration are weaker. And this may be connected to the characteristic of this environment, so the smaller, smaller depth and general more dyna dynamic environment and the region in the central proof of tanks, so the methane one, have more complex distribution of shallow gas. It may also be connected with the gas evolution um, and the concentration the concentration of methane in this point is general uh, in general higher than at Thank you, Damian, for your presentation. Uh, any other questions or comments? <coughs> oh, uh, artistic. So uh, one of the software is dedicated for the uh, for the um, equipment. So, so it's Taladina, and then I use MATLAB for analysis. Okay, but, uh, what about the graphs? Uh, graph, graphs are from MATLAB. I ta uh, take the raw data uh, from the equipment, and we have programs that were uh, written in the MATLAB to analyze echograms directly in the MATLAB. So we have uh, more data available for analysis than software uh, that are Sorry, can you repeat? Um, is there this is coded in our laboratory. Okay. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I have one. Uh, uh, could you uh, tell me something uh, about uh, meta uh, measurements in other uh, region in the Baltic Sea? So, other measurements in the Baltic Sea, another region that is very good recognized in terms of, of methane measurements is Eckenford. And uh, comparing this two region, we can see that that uh, layer of in which layer of sediments in which the methane occur in the uh, dense basin is shallower than comparing to the other regions of, of Baltic. Uh, this is uh, this is the first uh, aspect that it's uh, that stands out for this region. And about the changes in time. There is general lack, not lack of data, but lack of analysis in terms of, of 
changes in time. There are uh, many data that are scattered in time, but there is lack of, of general analysis how uh, how it's changed because when it's measured, uh, we uh, we confirm that this is the state of the environment, but not include the aspect that environment can change even throughout a few years. Thank you very much. Uh, so that's all for this session. Uh, but before the coffee break, I have an important announcement uh, for all presenters uh, of the poster session. Please upload your presentation, this sh short presentation, uh, to the Marta Konik. Uh, Marta will be uh, here. Uh, or come to me, and I, I will show you Marta. <laughs> and now it's time for coffee. So feel, feel free to have one.